Welcome everyone to this third and final session on innovations in water and climate. Uh, we're really excited to have everyone here and this, uh, this session is focused on climate uh, innovations in the rural side of water and climate. We had an excellent panel, uh, uh, excellent session this morning, albeit in uh, interrupted by the fire alarm on urban issues. And so this is the rural, uh, rural se uh, section of this uh, seminar. Um, we all understand that climate change is expected to have devastating impacts on smallholder farmers, those farmers that cultivate small plots of land with limited resources. Um, this occurs both directly through the impacts of heat as well as through increased um, unreliability of, uh, of changes in pre precipitation patterns and soil moisture. In effect, what we are going to end up with is some of the most vulnerable communities who were not responsible for creating the problem are going to end up paying the price for it. Uh, so in this session, what we really want to understand is what kinds of innovations uh, can we come up with uh, as a, a community, the water, global water community, that will address the needs of these most poorest and vulnerable communities. Um, we saw an excellent set of examples, as I said this morning, on the urban side, and we're going to explore a set of innovations on the rural side, looking at policy, looking at governance, looking at financing, technology, as well as digital platforms. What we want to have our discussion focus on, though, is not as much the innovations as, uh, themselves, which are, of course, really inspiring, but some of the design principles around embedding these innovations into systems. So we want to understand design principles that bias for equity, bias for, um, for scale, and bias for sustainability and, and avoiding unintended consequences. Um, so we'll start off with a keynote address by uh, Dr. Inga jacobs Mata, who is the country representative, country director of IVMI South Africa, and she leads the entire southern, the, the research and innovation in the southern region of Africa. We will follow that with a set of videos that were submitted by our online abstract presenters, followed by a panel discussion where we will reflect both on the abstract, uh, on the video presentations, as well as the experiences of the panelists. Uh, we will end with uh, a brief reflection uh, uh, by Ajita Padi from the India Climate Collaborative, uh, one of our co-sponsors for this seminar today, and uh, then conclude looking at across all three of the, 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 the water and climate seminars uh, and, and reflecting on common threads around the theme of just transitions. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, introduce myself. I'm Dr. Veena Srinivasan. I'm the executive director of Well Labs, Water, Environment, Land, and Livelihoods. We are a research and innovation lab based in Bangalore. So I'm wearing two hats today, both as the scientific program committee representative for the CV seminar, as well as Well Labs as a co-sponsor for the seminar today, along with India Climate Collaborative. Welcome, everybody, and uh, J uh, Inga, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Veena, and good to, good to be here today. I'm just going to load the presentation. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I'd uh, like to share a little bit about uh, some of the work that we're doing in Southern Africa, where we are developing um, accelerator programs. Uh, so we are scaling climate smart agriculture uh, and climate information services uh, through a, a program called an accelerator model. Um, and just sharing with you a little bit of the, the lessons learned along the way in terms of um, how, how this intersects with uh, this sort of just transition, right, that, we, that we're talking about in, in climate smart agriculture. Now, when we, when we think of rural water management, uh, we're referring to the practices that really balance very entrenched tradition with sustainability as well as innovation. Vina outlined that uh, really well in the introduction. But we also have to consider the unique challenges, strengths, uh, you know, struggles that rural communities have when managing their, their water resources. And so how does justice or these kind of just transitions uh, matter and why do they matter in this, in this context? Well, in the work that we do at, at IMI, we really believe that climate smart agriculture isn't just about technology, right, or about uh, a technique, 
an agronomic practice. It's about people at the end of the day. It's about ensuring that everyone, regardless of their background, regardless of uh, resources, they have equal access to the benefits, to the resources, um, and a say in decision making. Now, we know that there are you know, many sort of advantages and, um, and also pitfalls when we talk about how we scale climate smart agriculture in, in rural communities. But something that we've, we've done at IMI is we've developed a, a scaling, an adaptive scaling framework that was uh, developed through several previous projects. In fact, with, uh, with Nicole um, in the, the Feed the Futures program. And, and really the essence of this scaling framework is essentially it's about how we acknowledge the complexity of the, you know, the, the scaling, the, the ecosystem in which we are operating when we talk about scaling type innovations. Uh, it, it rests on these three principles at the end of the day. The first is really about um, how we co-design, how we test and, and make best fit innovation bundles. So it's not just about one innovation. We know that you know, the, there's a, a lot more sustainable outcomes if we bundle our climate smart uh, agriculture innovations and we co-design it with communities, with agribusinesses. That's our first sort of pillar, if you will. The second pillar is really about reaching, so ensuring that the, these best fit innovation bundles are able to reach stakeholders at different scales. So, you know, when we think about scaling, it's not just about scaling out, reaching many farmers. It's also about how we are working with policymakers to make sure that, you know, the, an enabling environment is in place. It's also about working with uh, finance institutions to make sure that there's inclusive finance uh, options for, um, for people that, that take up these, these innovations. And then the third is what we call acceleration, which is now really about sort of envisaging and, and enabling investments uh, in these areas, in these bundles of, of innovations. We also have a very strong focus around the agribusiness ecosystem, the work that we, we do. Um, we believe in a way it's we always say, uh, you know, SMEs, small, medium enterprises, they are the glue that link the farm to the market. Uh, now, we can have a, a, a debate about, you know, does this really benefit the poorest of the poor? Vina, you mentioned that. Um, this scaling model is really for small, medium enterprises and how they are able to reach vulnerable communities. Right, uh, so, so very much of this sort of focus on the agribusiness ecosystem. I thought I'd just mention that, uh, that upfront. But so, so just coming back to, to you know, share a practical example. So we have a, a project in Zambia. Um, it's called ICRA, which stands, it's a long acronym, <laughs> Accelerating Impacts of CGIRS Climate Research in Africa. Um, and, and the whole idea is for uh, how we work with these agri-SMEs. So we provide a, a call for applications and a scaling grant to agribusinesses. And then the, the component where we come in is then we help to scale uh, these innovations with our agribusiness partnerships and, and provide technical assistance. It's very much sort of uh, evidence-based technical, technical assistance in a range of issue areas from investment readiness support to um, impact measurement indicators, uh, whatever the needs are of that particular partnership. We also talk about we bundle innovations and we're bundling partners. So we realize that the partner model is really the, the, the best way to scale and to sort of help deal with all these complex realities on the ground. So this example of ICRA is um, providing scaling grants to, to these bundles of partners. We give 50,000 US dollars per partnership, but the, the, the ask is quite ambitious in that these partnerships have to reach uh, 75,000 farmers um, with their innovation. So if you think about it, it's less than a dollar a farmer. 
is very sort of ambitious, and that's why the partnership model and the scaling strategy is so important. So on the bottom of the screen there, I don't have, okay. Uh, we, we have these, we, we co-designed these bundles with, with uh, partners uh, in Zambia. The first one was, for example, ah, thank you so much. Um, the, the, the first one was um, solar irrigation coupled with microfinance and a digital marketing platform. So there's basically, uh, this was a, a group of partners that, uh, that were selected. There's three partners, three agri-SMEs in that partnership, and they work together. Uh, the solar pump provider helps, you know, uh, offers different pump solutions, the digital platform helps to share that information as well as other information around market pricing, around climate information to farmers, and then you have the, the MFI, the microfinance institution, providing different types of uh, products to farmers. That's, that's just one example. The second one is, for instance, integrated agriculture and aquaculture. So that's all about providing sort of nutritious ponds, uh, fingerlings in the whole agri aquaculture value chain. Uh, and there's about five partners working also sort of in this partnership model to, to reach scale. Third one is about the seed system in Zambia. So it's about how do we uh, provide good quality certified drought tolerant seed varieties in different value chains, coupled with insurance, uh, coupled with agronomic practices. You get what I'm saying? So it's sort of all different types of uh, bundles of innovations um, being scaled by bundles of, of partners. Um, and we've, we've ran this, this program. We, we were really happy with uh, the outcome. Um, the, there were 14 of these agribusinesses that we worked with in, in Zambia, and they've reached over 360,000 farmers in that uh, two-year frame, also um, were able to bring in additional finance through our investment readiness program. So there, you know, we, we, we were happy with sort of a 200% return on the original investment into the program. But we realized that it's not enough to only work on the agribusinesses, right, the SMEs. We needed to also look at how do we support the pipeline, and I think here's where we come to the, to the, the, the whole essence of this session which is about the enabling environment. So we created a sort of a complementary program called Innovation and Internship Grant Program, where we focus on strengthening the pipeline, right? Working with universities, um, helping to place students in these SMEs. Um, we worked on curriculum development with universities. Surprisingly, many university agriculture departments still have very traditional curricula. So they don't focus on climate smart agriculture. They don't focus on climate information services. And this is the need on the ground. So that was how we sort of worked with universities. I can go on and on about that, but time is of the essence. So I wanted to just mention a third aspect, which was once we've developed these bundles that were co-created with stakeholders, how do you get to share this message a little bit further? And so there we partnered with a, a television show uh, some of you who work in Kenya might know Shamba Shape Up. They're a reality show for farm improvement. Um, and, and, and they have expanded with our help in, into Zambia, where we profiled the work of these agri-SMEs on the first season. And you can just see some of the results there. I just want to show you a little clip of what it looks like. Okay, uh, don't worry about the sound. But, uh, but this is... You know, they, they've reached about 650,000 farmers in this first season already. I mean, they also look at a kind of, you know, extended uh, projected reach. If you think of that, it's not only one person watching a television show, right? You often watch in a family uh, setup. Um, so, so, so this is this is something that we we're using also as a way to get this kind of bundles of climate smart agriculture, climate information services, uh, a little bit uh, more accessible to, to many more, more people. Uh, and we can talk a little bit about that uh, in the end. So just to conclude, I think what uh, 
uh, Venus spoke about what are these design principles for scaling, for sustainability, for equity. I think for us, the lessons that we are learning as we go with these accelerator programs is really, one, there's, obviously there's no silver bullet for, for scaling. It really requires a, a very deep knowledge of the context, very adaptive approach. Um, we also know that, uh, you know, if we are to approach these kind of just transitions in our scaling endeavors, then we need to look at how do we also strengthen the entire ecosystem from the university to inclusive policies around access to finance, um, looking at markets, how do we enable markets, especially in our aquaculture bundle, where it's very difficult to access markets. Um, we also know that, I mean, the key bottleneck still is inclusive finance. How do you get women and youth-owned businesses access to finance? So sort of, you know, revolving schemes, other kind of credit facilities targeted at women and youth-owned SMEs is so important. Um, capacity building mechanisms, not only for these businesses, but also at the university level, also at the, the policy maker level to also um, share how we are doing uh, these kind of, you know, acceleration programs and what the benefits are. Uh, and, then, and then lastly, I think, you know, and perhaps most importantly is that this can't be done in isolation of a community. Uh, you really need the co-creation and the ownership of communities in, in designing right, those, those innovation bundles. And that's what, what we try to, to do with, uh, with this program. There's lots more to say, but I think we, we'll leave it at that for now, Vina, and then um, we can discuss it further in the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Inga, for that very energetic, uh, as always, uh, energetic and inspiring um, talk. So we're going to go over and have short videos by three abstract uh, uh, presenters. Only one of them, Hanan Hassan, is here. So if anybody wants to ask Hanan questions afterwards and catch her, please do so. Um, and the other two uh, abstract presenters are going to be online. All right. Oops. Sorry. Nope, that did not work.
India face a unique problem. Most farmers have small land holdings and are reliant on increasingly unpredictable rainfall. However, the country's water resources are already overexploited, leaving little room to expand irrigation. For rain-fed smallholders, the challenge is gaining a share of these limited resources. For farmers with access to irrigation, it is sustaining livelihoods in the face of changing rainfall patterns. Currently, the focus is on building structures like check dams or farm ponds to harvest and store more rainwater, thereby enabling farmers to grow a dry season crop. However, in many watersheds, all the available water is already being used. Thus, expanding irrigation for some would reduce water access elsewhere. Further, groundwater offers a critical buffer against climate variability. As it depletes, farmers become even more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. We need to replenish and sustain groundwater by rationalizing water use and allocating water equitably. For this, we need data at a granular scale on who is using water, where and how. But this presents two critical bottlenecks. First, data fragmentation. Decision makers often require data that is spread across multiple sources. This fragmentation creates inefficiencies and prevents them from drawing meaningful insights or triangulating different data sets. Second, analytical capacity. Grassroots organizations and village level bodies often lack the skills to access, analyze, and interpret the available data. To overcome these bottlenecks, well Labs presents Jaltol, a free and open source data analytics tool with the potential to revolutionize water management planning. Jaltol makes accessible the data locked into inaccessible formats in various government reports. It seamlessly integrates diverse data sets, including secondary sources and remote sensing data. It also unleashes the potential of available data sets by transforming complex information into simple insights. Imagine the possibilities. Government agencies can use Jaltol to develop a river basin plan by collating analyses from diverse data sets. Philanthropies can use Jaltol to prioritize investments by pinpointing water deficit regions and for the monitoring and evaluation of interventions. Local agencies and civil society groups can utilize Jaltol to create scientifically accurate water budgets and guide farmers in making better crop choices. With Jaltol, they can distribute water more sustainably and equitably. We envision a future where open data and scientific rigor form the cornerstone of on-ground decision making. Finding the balance between sustaining and exploiting water resources could help stabilize groundwater levels this could enable farmers to gain access to water and earn more. With Jaltol, we can turn this vision into reality, driving positive change at scale. Join us in paving the way to revolutionize water security in rural India. Welcome to ECA Africa. My name is Farid Wangara, Chief Operations Officer and Principal Officer. ECA Africa has been in existence for over 10 years. Started, started off as a project under Kilimo Salam, transitioned into ECA Africa in 2014. We have a very strong shareholding of Zepri, uh, which is a, a PTA commercial insurance company, Syngenta Foundation for Sustainable Agriculture, and Grameen Credit Agricole. 
ECA aims to use innovation and technology to radically enhance the livelihood of smallholder farmers in Africa. We have a regional presence in five countries, but are operating in 15 other countries, uh, working largely with smallholder farmers. We use innovation and technology to ensure smallholder farmers against climatic risks. Our basic uh, interest is to ensure that agriculture insurance is affordable to smallholder farmers by using various technological advancements to bring that down. We've ensured over 3 million farmers, and last year alone working with over 300 farmers and hoping to double that in the coming year. We are not an insurance company, but an insurance intermediary working with the demand and supply side. On the demand side, we work with local insurers and reinsurers in terms of product development, stakeholder coordination, technical support, risk monitoring, product improvement. And on the supply side, we work with various farmer aggregators, which would include organizations like financial institutions, developmental organization. But beyond that, we work with smallholder performers in terms of integrated risk management. Over the years, we've developed various um, <clears throat> various insurance products that resonate to, uh, to uh, climate change and uh, basically advancing farmers' way of looking at insurance. We've developed what we call a soil moisture index that is able to sort of use of satellite data to just measure the soil contents for farmers in, in the soils for different areas for farmers, thereby being offering very accurate way of um, uh, offering agriculture insurance. We've also developed what we call picture-based insurance where farmers are able to self-insure, take photos of how their crops are progressing, but beyond just the taking photos, farmers are able to get farm advisories. And on, on the advisories, we offer personalized advice in terms of risk management, pest management, uh, uh, soil management, water conservation, um, sustainable intensification so that with all these interventions, we hope that farmers can be able to increase their productivity and thereby thereby achieving food self-sufficiency within the countries of the operations. Thank you. Questions for this after the panel discussion. So I will also ask Anand to come up here after the panel discussion. But if you have questions, please uh, please hold them for a, for for just a few more minutes. Um, also, if people online have questions, uh, please do type them in the question in, in the chat. We will be we are monitoring the chat and we will be asking um, we will be responding to them. Um, during during the Q and A, um, so I'm going to go back, uh, move on to the panel. We actually have two people present here: uh, Inga, uh, Dr. Inga Jacobs Mata. Again, I'm going to invite you here um, uh, onto the stage. Um, our second panelist, who's present here in person, is uh, Dr. Nicole Lefort, um, who uh, has had 30 years of experience working in research and development in Sub-Saharan Africa, and she is with the uh, Georgi Water and Food. Uh, Global Institute at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, uh, Dr. Lefort, and um, we have two. We also have two online uh, panelists. Dr. Zakir Hussain uh, is the Dad German Academic Exchange Program Fellow, um, uh, and he uh, uh, with a PhD from Humboldt University. He currently leads uh, research uh, for the Zero Budget Natural Farming Program in the state of Andhra Pradesh in India. Um, and we have Alok Talikar uh, from Google Research, who has been uh, working with, uh, on working to use remote sensing and machine learning uh, to solve some of these very critical agricultural problems in the agriculture sector, uh, focused primarily in India as well. Um, are we, okay, excellent. Uh, so we have all four of our panelists here, and I'm going to actually start with uh, a simple um, question, which is, you know, a lot of times, so I feel like I'm playing bingo at World Water Week, which is the number of times you hear um, collective action, collaboration, engagement, community, data, you know, it's, it's a lot. So what I'm going to ask you to do is actually to start really small and tell me uh, about a story of, of one of the innovations that you have worked with, which actually made a difference and how it moved the needle on the ground for a smallholders farmer, just so that we kind of get really, really concrete, and then we'll kind of blow back up to the design principles that underpin this. Is that okay? So I don't know in what order we want to start, but I'm going to start with Nicole. Okay. 
do I need yeah, to? Yeah, I think it should be on. It should be on. Oh, it's on. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you very much for the question and always um, excited to share the work that we do um, in the field with farmers. Um, as Inga showed in her presentation, one of the major gaps to making small-scale irrigation available to smallholder farmers is finance. And so we really, um, in the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Small-Scale Irrigation, we really focused on the finance gap. And we worked with solar pump companies in providing asset-based or um, non-collateral finance. So it essentially allows smallholder irrigators to purchase a pump on credit. Um, and then they, it's either through a pay-go system or a rent-to-own system, um, and so there's some various financial instruments. But the innovation really comes in the social equity. It's not in the technology itself. And so the innovation was how to make these finance tools gender responsive. And we focused on the credit worthiness criteria by which the solar pump companies assessed whether women were credit worthy. Um, we looked at the evaluation process itself, and we also looked at capacity development uh, for the women uh, irrigators and, and farmers um, to help them access credit if they had been rejected for credit in the beginning. And so we really went from having no women qualifying for credit at the beginning, and I should say also we worked with four different solar pump distributors across four different countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we went with no women at the beginning qualifying to credit to having about 15% of sales going to women on credit, which was um, a major increase from where we had started, um, and that was just over a period of about 18 months. Um, so I won't go into the details of that, but um, our social innovation towards this equity and in inclusive transitions was focusing on how to make gender responsive um, credit instruments. For solar irrigation specifically. Correct. And yeah. so the primary kind of change in terms of putting money and, resi and improving mm -hmm. resilience was they were able to shift crops and grow more cash crops or? Right, so um, in most of the cases, they're growing um, nutrition-dense crops, they're growing high-value vegetables, um, but we also, one of the things that we learned working with the solar pump companies and the women farmers was that there's a lot of women who don't necessarily irrigate, but who are livestock keepers or poultry farmers. Um, and that was one of the things that the company learned by working with us in this project was that women actually use these pumps for more than um, just crop production in the dry season. And that really also expanded uh, the marketability um, and also the reach of the, the um, credit tools to enable more women to invest. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to switch to Alok um, online. And actually, I know, I know Alok, you work for Google and that's really, Google is tremendous in terms of data for transformation. I was wondering if though you can focus on kind of the pain point for the smallholder farmer that one of your solutions actually um, addresses and how that pain point is kind of addressed at that very, very granular level uh, to make impact. Yeah, I can try to add a few things. Uh, we don't interact with, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've definitely interacted with farmers before, uh, but we found that the easiest way for Google to have impact because we don't have a lot of feet on the ground is to uh, operate through uh, large agencies like governments uh, or UN bodies or uh, sort of social organizations. Uh, <clears throat> and, and we are trying to be transparent data providers that can lead uh, these organizations to be more effective in decision making. Uh, we don't promote or propose any policy or, or anything of, of that sort, nor do we provide information that is personally identifiable. Uh, but using satellite imagery, we try to derive uh, sort of data that is easy to understand and easy to make decisions on, whether it is uh, sort of like, you know, agricultural sort of food security, fertilizer allocation, or uh, in this case, uh, sort of like, you know, um, infrastructure that's been made through government funds for water security. Uh, and, like, you know, over time, we are seeing that for countries that are cash strapped, like uh, India and, and other countries in the global south, I think 
remote sensing based solutions are probably going to be the only really scalable solutions. And, um, and I think sort of we, we aim to ride on the back of the digital stack that has been quite successful uh, in India and helping the government sort of digitize uh, sectors like agriculture and support smallholder farmers uh, to get equitable access to resources. Because if, if you can handle remote sensing uh, for smallholder fields and uh, water bodies like wells and farm ponds that have been mentioned before, uh, I think it, it can be a great equalizer, uh, which I think like, you know, distribution of resources through other means cannot Come back to the digital stack because I do think that what India has done with in terms of digital public goods and the digital stack is uh, really, really transformative. But actually, I'm going to uh, challenge you a little more in terms of just uh, uh, giving me an example. So you said, for example, one example is fer fertilizer uh, allocation. So do you mean that remote sensing would help um, maybe district uh, CEOs figure out where fertilizer was required the most and then allocated to those gram panchayats or villages that need it? Is that kind of the, what do you mean by resource allocation? Let, let, let me explain things uh, more, more plainly. Uh, so if you're able to identify and, and address things at the level of individual fields and the government is able to tie that to individual farmers, uh, currently resource allocation happens um, at at a district scale or some administrative scale and not at sort of the field level. Uh, and I think <clears throat> knowing which farmers are actually producing something, knowing uh, is this field actually being cultivated? Because many times what you see is, it's like, you know, depending on when you ask and who you ask, what's actually happening in the field is reported differently. In a drought season, many farmers would claim that they're growing cotton to get some uh, sort of insurance. Uh, and, and markets cannot operate if uh, every year uh, insurance companies end up losing money, right? Uh, and I think today there is a broad-based allocation of resources, uh, which means that everybody gets Ten dollars, but uh, like, you know, if, if you could allocate a large amount of money to farmers who are actually affected uh, and impacted by extreme climate, they could do a better job. Uh, another example is uh, in a drought-prone region. If you are able to identify where actually there is a, a like, you know water resources available, like wells and farm ponds, and where they are not present, if there is an additional budget available, how do you allocate? that resource um, and you know, are you ensuring that smallholder farmers have equal access to resources um, surrounding them? Another example is, are there sufficient sort of cold storage locations or appropriate processing locations for the crops that are being grown in a region? Another example is, uh, can you uh, sort of it provide- does that it actually works. Um, uh, thank you very much. That was very, very valuable. I just want to make sure that we were getting really specific. So thank you, Anur. Um, um, uh, Inga, do you want to go next? And then I'll go back to Dr. Hussein online. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, I, I shared the, the Zambia example mm -hmm. uh, of, of our accelerator program. But maybe, maybe one other um, that we are working at at a more regional level uh, through something called our Food Food Systems Accelerator, um, in a similar way that we we work on this kind of bundling of innovations, um, we East and Southern Africa. I'm, I'm not sure how many know, uh, but it's a very maize-based region. Um, although not only it, it, while maize is not the only contributor to to uh, you know malnutrition, uh, we we do have very low. Uh, uh, well, high malnutrition levels in the region. Um, maize is also um, very vulnerable to pests and diseases like fall army worm, uh, climate change, and it also leads to degraded uh, land as well. 
So something that we're doing in the region, um, in sort of 12 countries in East and Southern Africa, is to look at how do we diversify. How do we diversify from maze-based systems, but also then how do we intensify those systems so that you know there's, uh, there's not such a, a huge environmental impact and that communities are not uh, left worse off if, if we diversify. Um, so, so some of the things that we're working on there, again, in this, I'm really a sort of a strong <laughs> supporter of, of these kind of innovation bundling, uh, is through mechanization coupled with what Nicole was talking about, small-scale irrigation, um, but, but sort of experimenting with these service provider models. Um, and, and that, I think, when, when you couple mechanization with uh, irrigation, whether it's now solar or you know, some other kind of drip irrigation, and conservation, agriculture, uh, and a finance solution, then I think you have something more sustainable. Um, I just wanted to also respond to, to Alok's point because we also really bring in a lot of digital agriculture now into these bundles. But then the question is how do you then work with um, how do, you, how do you ensure access for illiterate farmers uh, or farmers without a cell phone? And that's also something you know, that we try to, to include in our process. So it's, it's uh, working through lead farmer uh, arrangements, working through farmer associations, uh, to uh, even through theatre, we, we even partner with uh, you know, community-based theatre, just to ensure that these kind of innovations also can reach the most vulnerable. Yeah, so I think these are excellent great. points because I think what we sort of heard, you know, so far as digital can do, can scale really quickly, can also scale really wrong if you don't get those <laughs> things at the local level really well. And I know, Nicole, you've talked about it. But I wanted to, sometimes I wonder whether we are setting farmers up for failure because we're, you know, we're investing all of these in challenges and so on, but it feels like the game's rigged against them because the large subsidies and so on are kind of flowing, at least in countries like India, it's an input subsidy policy, which means it goes to you know, big fertilizer seed companies, which smallholder farmers don't actually get a share of that because it's rigged. So the reason we have Dr. Zakir Hussain here is again in India, one of the most uh, innovative policy examples has been um, the state of Andhra Pradesh's move as a state to move completely to natural farming and uh, based on agroecological principles. And it's been incredibly interesting to, say what hap to see what happens when a state decides that we're going to move completely to this. Not, uh, and so smallholder farmers are not switching to uh, pesticide-free or natural farming methods because they're going to get market premiums, but because the state's now set up infrastructure to enable that. Uh, Dr. Sen, can you comment a little bit on how that experiment uh, has kind of actually helped smallholder farmers in the state? And I know you lead research there as well. Yeah, thank you. So uh, this is a path-breaking innovation that is happening in Andhra Pradesh where um, we uh, capitalize on knowledge and knowledge rather than capitalizing on giving inputs and other sub subsidies. So it's a knowledge centric uh, agriculture started in uh, 2017 uh, with the collaboration with the government of Andhra Pradesh. And uh, initially it was uh, 40,000 farmers have shifted towards these farming practices. Now in 2023, we have reached 10 million farm, farmers in Andhra Pradesh. And our goal is to completely shift entire Andhra Pradesh into uh, farmers in Andhra Pradesh into these practices, uh, which is an agroecological approach. And also we are starting an academy uh, on natural farming to main, our main success is based on the uh, collective action uh, of, of women self-help groups. And also the champion farmers. Uh, we train the farmers on these agroecological principles. They will go and teach the farmers. Farmer to a farmer extension is happening in the villages. Apart from this, we have also established a lot of evidence. Uh, uh, initially, when we started uh, the natural farming uh, innovation in Andhra Pradesh, so many used to question, where is the evidence for that? So we also established a lot of evidence in terms of greenhouse gas emission reduction and then water savings, uh, all cost reduction, which is most crucial to the farmers, small and marginal farmers. There is huge cost reduction that is happening in Andhra Pradesh also. 
So this is entirely relies on uh, nine universal principles, and then uh, we're also like uh, she said, uh, we are also bundling bundling innovations. Uh, like uh, we have started uh, a 365 days green cover uh, in uh, as a drought prone drought proofing model in dry areas of Andhra Pradesh, uh, where we are covering the entire uh, land for 365 days and diversifying the. Um, many crops by increasing the biodiversity of the crops. So farmers are getting more incomes and there is a reduced migration uh, uh, from the villages to the cities as well. And also the, the increase in soil health, soil moisture, and also overall farmers are very uh, interestingly up and happily accepting these principles and then moving step by step to the completely adopting these practices. So that is our success. Uh... I think that uh, one thing that I understand the knowledge based interventions, which is the champion farmers, farmer to farmer extension and so on. Uh, did Was there anything done on the subsidy side as well uh, in terms of uh, reallocating subsidies or anything from that perspective? No, no we, we, we have not worked on subsidy sides so that reallocating subsidies that when farmers are saving this lot of uh, uh, cost of cultivation instead of providing subsidies we asked them to provide to uh, uh, giving knowledge uh, that help to provide uh, uh, on in, in capitalize on uh, knowledge so to the government of andhra pradesh to uh, in creating the building capacity building of the farmers so that some of the subsidies have been converted uh, to support these farmers uh, this program as well in andhra pradesh And the government of Andhra Pradesh is uh, uh, supportive and they have farmer service centers and uh, they, they're all supporting in a very good way. Agriculture department itself is convinced and, in, uh, and part of them, many of the people in this uh, organization, they are part of these innovations and in transforming the uh, perceptions of the farmers, uh, shifting from chem uh, conventional chemical farming to the natural farming practices. I, I'm, uh, I, if I, I would, I would have been more skeptical if I hadn't seen uh, farmers actually paying in some of these villages for uh, extension services because the cost of inputs, is, especially chemical inputs, being so high. So the fact that the state is picking that up is uh, is very interesting. So we've kind of seen the reason all of you are here are actually because. Uh, each of you represents sort of a different pillar. Inga, you've kind of looked at innovation, Nicole through financing, um, Dr. Hussein coming from the policy side, and then um, uh, Alok coming from the, the data side. So uh, so that's the reason we curated this particular panel. And I'd one, I was wondering now whether you can talk about um, some of the design principles to, that have allowed you to enable that pillar to work at scale but also some cautionary tales that you've you've uh, you've learned along the way about what can go horribly wrong. So, Nicole, starting with you because I know sure. you have some stories here. Yeah, great. Thank you. And this is a really important um, discussion on the risks that can arise as you're learning. So, I think one of the important things about this concept of bundling is that it's very local. So, and that's what's one of the benefits of it is that it allows you to adapt to the local context. And in that regard, most of Sub-Saharan Africa um, irrigation sits, irrigation that is small scale and small holder and decentralized sits out of public agencies and there is either little or no subsidy on this. So it's a very different context in that sense than, than some of the other regions. And so in our project, um, essentially what we were doing is really bypassing public agencies um, because they weren't involved and this is excluded from public policy and we partnered directly with companies. And in the process of that, we engage the public sector with the companies together so that the public sector is learning as we're learning and then they're more able to grow into the roles that are needed to support the private sector. So for us, a really basic principle of the scaling was the, the market-based approaches and the partnerships with companies that were focused around learning and engagement um, and really challenging each other and all of the different actors in terms of what our perceptions were about the market 
and about the market segments, um, and in our case, particularly about reaching women. And another important part of it was really de-risking for the companies and for the smallholder farmers um, the investments that farmers needed to make in um, the technologies and other inputs. And um, de-risking the companies um, approaches to expanding their distribution networks and their market outreach to women. Um, and that was really important for the companies because otherwise they're going to go for the most high income farmers. Um, in terms of risks, um, I think that what we learned um, over a period of about two or three years was that there are similar finance approaches being used um, across different inputs. So maybe for the seed, maybe for mechanization services, um, maybe f even for insurance and other elements, and we are each looking at our own interventions and what the impact of those are and what the risks are to those farmers, but we're not looking at them holistically. We're not looking at them together. And so while we are celebrating these innovations in finance, we could also be and are likely putting the farmers at more risk because they're borrowing and they're taking credit to cover all of these services and inputs. And unless we start looking about looking at the um, indebtedness and the risks overall that we're putting farmers into, um, we may really be reaching those unintended consequences. Um, so we can celebrate our individual interventions and innovations, but we really have to go back to looking at this more holistically. So each of the financing mechanisms mm -hmm. is giving farmers basically loans, but at the end of it, the total loan or the total debt they're incurring is beyond what the, the capacity to pay back. Yeah, that's right. And, and in some cases, um, there are even interventions that are seeking to bundle the mechanization services, the um, agrochemicals and the fertilizers, um, the irrigation services the, and, the, and the finance tools, and they're all being bundled through one supplier. And um, in some cases, those are also the same suppliers that are providing the information and telling and advising the farmers on what they should be buying. And so in some cases, we may be over integrating and over bundling and um, could be putting farmers more at risk through those, those types of um, interventions. Right. Inga, any cautionary tales in terms of in the process of scaling? What do we need to worry about? Well, I mean, I think um, so it's, a, it's a good point that, that Nicole makes. Um, I mean, if you, if you think about investment in, in ag tech, right? I would say at least in, in East and Southern Africa, it's mostly donor driven uh, foundation, right? FinTech is a little bit different, you know, the impact investment comes into play. But, but if I just think of sort of investment into agriculture, climate smart agriculture innovations, um, I think there, there is perhaps a tendency now to, to, to push a certain type of, of innovation. So you do have a situation of sort of donor darlings, you know, uh, developing. Um, and, and then once that, that funding, you know, runs out, uh, we're not creating a sustainable pipeline. So I do think there, there is, we, we have to be a little bit more cautious around that. Um, and then the, the other point is also around, I think, moving from access, so access to this innovation to actual use. Uh, I think sometimes the, the lines uh, do, get, do get blurred um, because of this need that we have to report on sort of millions, mm -hmm. right? There is a bit of a difference. And so we're looking at things like, you know, affordability studies, adoption studies, really looking at like the behavioral change that actually happens. Um, and, and access is okay, right? It's the first step, but now moving, moving beyond that. Yeah, that's, and I really like the point you made about the sustainability of donor darlings because mm -hmm. you're almost pumping, you know, setting them up to fail in, in a way. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'm actually going to go over to Alok. Alok, I interrupted you before when you started talking about the digital stack. And actually, I think it would be helpful to talk about how the digital stack works uh, in terms of how that's actually transformed a whole bunch of sectors. So quick two minute, you know, version for the dummies version of it, because nobody here is a tech person. So, yeah. Sure. Uh, so I think th this is kind of revolutionary for, for almost anywhere else in the world. Um, 
and, and the government has been really successful at this uh, more than anybody uh, expected in their wildest dreams. Uh, the backing of this goes almost over a decade uh, or more than a decade now, which is based on a biometric based identity platform. Uh, I, I used to live in the US and like, you know, this, this would be uh, kind of impossible to do uh, there. Uh, but in India, it's actually seen as a very positive thing uh, because the, the you know, based on this identity platform, um, government is able to do any kind of uh, subsidy or any kind of distribution of wealth uh, to uh, like, you know, not just farmers, but people who are uh, like, you know, really in need. Uh, and so in many ways, uh, women now get money in their bank accounts and banks are sort of forced to have zero or low balance bank accounts for everybody. Uh, and so it's, it's, a, it's a great equity provider as well, where the husbands or, or other family members don't get access to this money. Uh, similarly, I think there has been a transformation based on this identity platform, which is uh, creating a payments platform where there is peer to peer transactions that is instantaneous delivery of money from one account to the other account, uh, which is through uh, primarily uh, uh, a coalition of banks running this, uh, managed by uh, RBI, which is the national uh, regulator for, uh, for finances. Uh, and uh, basically uh, this is like, you know, Visa, Master, any, any other technology, they are either wallets or they are through some system which has like a many days of delay between transactions being fully fulfilled. You, know, you may pay for something when you go to a store today, uh, but the money actually reaches the merchant three days later. Uh, whereas in India, using this payment stack, which is called UPI, uh, there is instantaneous delivery from one bank account to another bank account. Uh, and, and for a low trust society like India, this is amazing because the money is actually in your bank. It's not uh, through some third party vendor or, or like, you know, some, some other large faceless organization. Uh, and this has really transformed uh, the country in terms of uh, more and more people who are informal workers uh, becoming formalized uh, and delivery of uh, services that the government used to do have become leakage free. So, money that used to go through multiple intermediaries can now flow directly from government to a person's bank account. Uh, and, and which again means that like, you know, uh, I think there was a saying about 30, 40 years ago from an earlier prime minister we had that only 15% of the money was actually getting delivered. Uh, today, that is really, really uh, high. I think upwards of 90% is actually getting delivered. Um, and so even if, countries are poor and they cannot allocate large amounts of resources. Uh, if you can make that resource allocation effective, uh, you can have a transformative impact. And that's- Look, I wanted to quickly ask a, a trickier question because we have seen on the other, one hand, we talked about credit and instantaneous payments and digital stacks can help. I've seen both examples at the field level on one hand where farmers, um, their bank account, the Jandan bank accounts are actually controlled by middlemen who keep all of their bank accounts with them mm -hmm. and actually take the money. I've seen that version of it. And I've also seen farmer cooperatives where farmers cooperate to ensure that they control um, access of the flows through Manrega payments and so on. Can you quickly, in, in 30 seconds, because I do want to go to Dr. Hussein as well, quickly talk about some of the risks and what are the guardrails that need to happen when you want to have this kind of large scale transformation? Uh, is there, what, what needs to happen on the ground and what's the role of other players? Because we, I also don't want to over romanticize it because like I said, we've seen both sides of it from the field. Yeah, like, so technology is technology. Right? Like, you know, it's ultimately based on who is actually enforcing the laws. Uh, many systems that are technologically foolproof can be gamed by social engineering. Um, which is well beyond something that designs can protect against. Uh, and so there needs to be more use of uh, sort of like, you know, more information that's available to 
uh, people on the ground who, who have access to their bank accounts. Uh, I think that does require sort of more organizations uh, with feet on the ground being, being more active. Uh, and so th these kinds of problems are going to plague any society. Um, the other risks on technology, since your previous question was about that, is that decision-making should not be entirely taken based on technological recommendations. So an AI recommendation should not be blindly implemented to scale things up. Uh, for example, a, a YouTube video that is sort of a bad recommendation has very low impact. You can swipe it away and you can go on to watch the next video. But the implication of a recommendation that impacts somebody's livelihood should generally have a human in the loop rather than independently being sort of scaled massively. Makes sense. And so basically good to hear that. And, and I think human in the loop is a good um, uh, takeaway point for us. I know that this is a topic which is uh, seems a little out there for the World Water Week audience. But I think that as long as we understand that Digital, the, 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 that train of digitalization is, is moving. It's not going to get reversed or stopped, which means that we as a sector kind of need to be uh, aware of kind of what the guardrails that we need to be building. And so that's really uh, useful to understand how we kind of become better humans in the loop. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, end with Dr. Hussein actually now. Um, on um, Dr. Hussein, can you reflect a little bit on some of the risks um, I know some of the skeptics on the natural farming side have kind of said, we saw what happened to Sri Lanka. Why would you do this at such a large scale without kind of experimenting and building evidence ground up? And I, how, do you, how do you respond? So, skepticism from uh, the, all the research institutes in India, everywhere. So, we started slowly working on this, uh, uh, establishing the evidence of uh, so social, ecological, and then especially yields. Uh, we in convergence with uh, various uh, international research organizations, University of Reading and World Agroforestry and uh, you know, some of the national research organizations. And we had a lot of studies on how it will really and we found that there is no yield penalty. Basically, the uh, initial uh, skepticism we had is yields will be reduced for if you adapt to uh, natural farming. So in uh, many studies, we found that we are tracking the yields from last four, four years. There is no yield penalty if you shift to the natural farming practices. Apart from that, there is additional bonus of uh, climate resilience and then water re reduction. <clears throat> And also the, uh, what we have we tried is when you shift from monocropping system to multiple cropping system for 365 days a year, a year uh, all the problems in the crop production uh, we, we can, can be minimized because it, that's a coping strategy where we have observed. And one the thing is looking at all these positive uh, results. There is a 60 to 80 percent uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emission, and also the, the incomes are increasing from year by year from where farmers have adopted, and more farmers are joining uh, into the force of uh, champion farmers. So that uh, that we need to build the capacities and um, uh, which is a sort of de-skilling and skill, uh, skilling of the farmers, and then they they will be used as champions to uh, invest on the knowledge uh, transformation. I think we had a really good set of remarks. I don't know if either Nicole or Inga want to reflect on either of the any of the points that were made. Um, yeah, I mean, just briefly, I mean, I think um, the, the issue of better humans in the loop, I think, is really critical. And as we looked at gender responsive finance tools, this was a big part of it, um, because a lot of the digitalized finance tools, whether it's credit assessments um, or um, how the um, payments are managed, 
a lot of that is biased against women. So there's a lot of gender bias in digital tools. And so by looking at the process overall um, and understanding where those biases were and where we needed to have that human intervention to make those cor corrections, um, that was a, a really critical part of um, us trying to work towards that social equ equity um, and that inclusivity in this transition. Inga? Not, not too much. Um, incidentally, uh, you know, just, just listening to Nicole, we, we're also developing at the moment a digital inclusivity index, which is also trying to address some of, some of those issues, um, working at the innovator level, but also, you know, at the finance level to, to sort of look at how inclusive digital uh, uh, tools are and how they could be revised to, to you know, better include uh, or better be designed uh, to, to address the needs of women and youth. So it's from an access, from a use, uh, from multiple criteria. So stay tuned for more on that soon. <laughs> Excellent. So what I'm going to actually do is invite Hanan up as well and then open it up for Q&A. And, um, and we have uh, Janelle, if you could monitor online and read out any questions online. Yes, gentlemen at the back. Hello, yeah, my name is Henk from Meta Meta, and we work with smart center groups, which is training centers on low-cost water technologies. My question is, have you thought of, because financing is the big issue, um, have you thought of cooperation with the wash sector? You know, many of the small farmers live in areas where there's no basic service, so no good water source without 30 minutes walking from the home. Now. For instance, in, in Zambia, there's examples that farm wells deliver water to 40 people around them. And if you subsidize these farm wells, you have the SEG 6 one, but you also have water for irrigation, small scale irrigation, and you have gender, etc. So the question again is, have you thought of cooperation with the wash sector for subsidies for farm wells? And so reach SEG 6. Thank you. I think Inga, that's a <laughs> Okay, should we take a couple yeah. more? Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? Are there questions online? No. Okay, you want to? Okay. Well, uh, I think uh, we could do more, certainly. Uh, and we have a meeting, <laughs> you and I, <laughs> tomorrow, uh, on that. But um, I, I think where we have seen the alignment is around, uh, in fact, learning from the wash sector how to implement multiple use water services, right, and how that can be included into climate smart agriculture innovation implementation. Um, still very siloed, I would say, you know, uh, we, we, we don't do enough uh, collaboration there, but... Um, but IVMI has yeah. actually been working on multiple use systems yeah. for at least 20 absolutely. years. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think so just the principles are the same, you know. Yeah. Um, but not with much, tra without traction, I think. Yeah, and I'll come in on that. Um, I know there's at least one case in Senegal where um, they were looking at irrigation service provision. Um, there's a lot of, you know, it, some of this comes back to the water, G, water energy food nexus. And across these sectors, we're really learning from each other. And we've learned a lot from the energy sector in terms of, uh, in terms of service provision and finance tools. And we're now looking at more on the wash side. So there's a case in Senegal where there was a wash service provider. So essentially water supply to rural areas. And um, they are, there's an, a, a small intervention or investment that is de-risking them to figure out how to build on that water distribution center for wash through irrigation service provision. Um, and that's the only case I know formally where there has been a very deliberate intervention and business model design to go from wash service provision and supply to irrigation service provision. Um, so it's something that we're definitely looking at and, and we're looking at these few cases to, to see where it's complementary and where the distribution networks overlap or, or don't. I think it's also this, I know that it, IVMI has more examples. I know there are examples in Nepal, for example, which is where it was done deliberately. But I think one of the, the flip side of that is also to, to ask if 
in some of these places, if it's not done, are there unintended consequences? Because people are going to oh, use yeah. water for what they want anyway. If they have goats, they're not going to let their goats die or whatever. So if that's the only source of water that comes into the village, they're going to do their kitchen garden or their goats or whatever else. And so if the system isn't designed, the wash system isn't designed for multiple users, there are mm. consequences as well. And, and yeah. the literature on this is surprisingly... Small. Small, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I would say also one of the important things to remember is in sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of the smallholder irrigation is actually groundwater. It's not surface water. Surface water is really important to the um, large schemes, but the household or decentralized self-supply irrigation is mostly groundwater. And so some of the risks that we're looking at in terms of the multiple use is um, agrochemical pollution, um, and what risk that puts the household at. So if it's not designed intentionally and there's no systems for filtering water or monitoring water, or in a lot of cases, no guidelines at all on agrochemical use. Um, so there's that, that's that flip side for the, for the risk. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> yes, please. Uh, versus, for instance, stock watering and wash systems. Mm. Irrigation is using a lot of water. And then in many cases you will see, as soon as I introduce irrigation, it put a big risk, especially on the underground uh, resources. Because the underground resources usually is not, um, uh, you know, there's not a lot of water available. And it's expensive water, it needs to be lifted. And as soon as you start irrigating there, irrigation is using a lot of water. So yep. we must usually be careful there when we introduce irrigation, especially in areas where there is a limited to water resources. Yeah. That's only one comment from my side. Thank you, Chip. I was wondering if anybody else wants to comment. Yep. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the inspiring talk. Uh, my name is Robert. I'm a data and climate lead at Aqua Foundation. Uh, I'm curious about a um, comment you made earlier about um, challenges of market access. Uh, for aquaculture, um, I mean, I know if you're doing all this work on sort of promoting climate smart agriculture in international markets, that obviously has a lot of traction if you can have data that shows all the good work that you're doing and the changes you're making. That's stuff that usually international markets can eat up and you can sell your products better that way. But I know and you know that, you know, often small holder producers aren't accessible to the international markets. There's a lot of local markets you sell that. Um, so I was curious just in general about the challenges you were mentioning if you want to expand on that because I'm also very interested in like how do you create that market premium if you will from promoting all these good practices that you're doing and does that in any way generate some more money coming into them to create you know financial sustainability in the long term. Do you want to comment? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I'd love. Uh, really, really interesting sort of, you know, uh, parallels that you you're picking up. For for our work, I think it, at least in in East and Southern Africa, it's it's often quite uh, simple, but it's really hard issues. <laughs> roads, access to roads, access to storage. Right. So once you are able to get your goods. Eight hours, you know, on uh, often flooded roads, say from northern Zambia to, you know, a market. Uh, much of that produce is is already wasted by the time it gets to the market. So it's those kind of things. When I say access to markets, it's more the kind of local markets, right? Yeah, and and, and that's why I think the enabling environment is so important because for when we talk SMEs, you know, in country. Uh, it's really these these issues, and they they are they are uh, good stories here and there. You know, um, many partners working on sort of re uh, solar powered cold storage systems, uh, mobile storage on bicycles. You know, things like that. Uh, but is it enough to move the dial of you know an entire uh, economy or value chain? I think that's the that's where we are right now. I, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, no, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm. I'm just going to talk about uh, maybe my, the the what we are trying to go to, like the way that we can see the world is going, is to innovative technology, and this is great. But we have to take into consideration that technology is expensive, 
So we are in developing countries. We are implementing those projects. And as you mentioned, Nicole, previously, financially, the farmers cannot afford such technology. We are, we are now supporting through projects, through funds. But afterwards, the, far, it's the farmers who are going to do the maintenance, who are, op or who are going to operate all the systems. So this is uh, challenging. It's not that it's impossible, but it takes time. So, uh, so farmers, until, until the farmers reach a stage from somehow chaotic situation to rules and regulations, it's taking time to accept technology, to accept uh, the amount of water that should be irrigated. And we have to talk also, like to have to take along in parallel, that we're not going to only target farmers, we should also ta target the co governments. Because uh, if, I have, if I'm saving water through the project, which is on a small scale compared to all the area, however, my government, for example, is uh, importing avocado seedlings to, to plant. And everyone knows how much avocado is, uh, consumes water. And so I'm saving water on one side, and I'm uh, losing or wasting much of water on the other side, where I'm not, I'm not planting native species. Uh, so this is very important to highlight. So there should be awareness, not only on small scale farmers, it should be awareness on governments, on policies, on, on, on bigger, uh, bigger uh, sectors than only the farmers. Um, so, Anna, Anna and I think we are actually running out of time, but did you want to quickly wrap up one last comment and then we uh, can... Yeah, that's all my, my input. So I, since I'm, I'm implementing projects and I'm in, uh, through this experience, I, I know that everyone has this experience and, every, and many are leaders in this. So I, I, love, I would love that you consider all these comments and the lessons that we, uh, we find it very important. Sounds good. Um, actually, I'm going to thank the panel because it's time for us to, to wrap up and we're already reduced. Oh, there's one last comment oh, at the back. Okay, yeah. Just two short comments. One on the technology, the cost of the technologies. There is a lot of new technologies can, that can make wells yeah. and pumps, locally produced pumps, that can really reduce the technology, the cost of wells. An example is Amos technology that make wells and pumps to 20 meters deep for $200. The next one is the observation on depleting groundwater if we start to use groundwater irrigation. There is a recent report of the World Bank that yep. indicates indeed there is a risk. But if we combine rainwater harvesting, so make sure that all the rain goes into the ground mm -hmm. and you combine that with low cost wells, mm -hmm. small wells, there is no problem with depletion. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, thank you very much to the panel as well as to the two online panelists. Um, uh, it's, it's really been a pleasure having you. Um, I think the next, we're, we're actually going to just have a few minutes left, but I'm going to see if we can get um, Ajita Padi, who is the session uh, sponsor from India Climate Collaborative. Uh, Ajita, I don't know if you're online. Um, what, what we were really hoping for is this was a, clim uh, a session on water and climate. I realized that we covered a very, very wide range from innovation to markets, to, um, uh, to technology. And part of the reason is from what Inga also, uh, you know, one of the themes is if you really want this to work for smallholder farmers, you kind of can't pull out one strand. You kind of do need to look at it in a holistic manner. Fine, I think Ajita is not available online. Uh, so I think we're actually going to end up with the two other session conveners, the two Amandas, first the Amanda and Amanda. Yes. Uh, so this was a, the finale of three water and climate sessions. The first one was uh, uh, Amanda from Human Rights to Water, the Human Right to Water, and then um, the other Amanda from WRI, uh, who respectively, Amanda kind of started off the three sessions with the online webinar kind of laying out principles for a just transition. And then this morning, um, uh, we had the session on, on cities and water and climate in urban areas. So we were going to wrap up with just one reflection from each of you of what your key takeaway from across the three sessions was. So do you want to start? Yeah, sure, I can start. Uh, thank you, Vina. And uh, it was really great to hear on the agriculture part. 
some of the innovative work that's coming out in the cities session where we were looking at uh, climate and water in cities. We, I guess the key, key innovative um, factor that I took away is, um, well, finance is, a, is an enabling and disabling factor, while digital solutions are emerging, while also policy innovations are emerging. We still have the Global North and the Global South uh, relationships, particularly in terms of citizen. This was also highlighted, uh, um, I think, by one of the speakers, where a lot of the support that's in our cities um, is support from the develop development space. Now, what that means is that a lot of, of the innovation rests on relationships between the Global North and the Global South. The ongoing um, culture that needs to be reframed in terms of respect, in terms of how agency is viewed from uh, bottom up, uh, be in you know, small innovations, be uh, a global south governments, but that engagement and the nature of relationship between global north and global south is what seems to be at the heart, at the core of what needs to happen to change the needle in terms of the innovations we take up, in terms of the conversations we take up and how we hear and listen to, to each other. I'll pass over to you, Amanda, in terms of to hear from the Just Transition uh, conversation from last night. Sure. Um, yes, yeah, so we started off thinking about uh, why we needed Just Transition. And it's to do, in, in the water climate environment, um, people are um, affected, and it's typically the vulnerable people that are affected the most. And so we need to find a transition that includes everybody in the solutions and doesn't disadvantage the people that probably have to give up the most in some of the processes that we're looking to transition from old fossil fuel type technologies to new technologies and so on. <coughs> And I think a common theme that's run throughout all of the three, uh, three sessions is that we need to work with people at a local level and we need to involve people. Um, this, this actually does form part of the human rights uh, based approach framework, which is an international legal framework. We can draw upon that as a, as a way to help with some of the solutions. And I think that uh, it seems to me that the governance around all of this is what needs to change to be more inclusive in decision making and to involve more people. And there are laws that already give us that framework, but they're not being integrated at local level. They come in at the national level and they might or might not be included at that level and then they're not integrated down to the decision making community level that we really need. And those, uh, those are some of the solutions we need to think about to actually scale some of the solutions, like some of the innovations in the, in the city uh, presentations where um, lots of small solutions that can work at local level, but there's very little way to scale, <coughs> to scale them unless you can change the governance around the policies, the regulations, and, uh, and integrate a more human rights-based acro acro approach across the whole. System. Wonderful. I'm going to just end with two thoughts from me. The two takeaways I heard bundling from uh, from Inga, which I really really liked. Uh, I really liked Nicole's points around uh, changing criteria so that it goes to the right the right people. And then what I got from the the policy, of course, and and that policy can impact at scale, uh, but. Uh, this the idea of human in the loop because what we are going to see is we're talking about water and climate in a world where human societies are rapidly changing both with technology and ai and how we remain human at, and and actually keep making that work in at the scales that we work at i think is really important so that was a key takeaway for me but thank you very much and thank you to all of the audience i know we're way over time today thank you so much